Eric Rignot held a keynote talk on October 7, 2019, at the Beckman Center of the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering in Irvine, California. Formula per century is not uh, a lullaby. It actually occurred about 13,000 years ago during the major deglaciation in the northern hemisphere and some parts of Antarctica, which we're still trying to unravel. For about several centuries, sea level was rising four meters per century. So that's the point of back in time that tells us when you melt ice sheets in a catastrophic way, you can get to these very high rates of, uh, of sea level. But right now, we're raising sea level at 30 centimeters per century, so a factor of 10 less. So as a glaciologist, that's what I'm worried about. Uh, not about the current rate of sea level, but whether we could actually go 10 times faster. Some of the processes driving this in Greenland, the surface is, uh, is melting, it's producing runoff, and uh, the glaciers reach the coastline and break into icebergs. In the Antarctic, we don't have much uh, melt at the surface because it's too cold. And a lot of the ice is extending in the ocean and forming these floating ice shelves that interact with the ocean and eventually break into these, uh, these tabular icebergs. We see here superglacial water, superglacial river that eventually falls into a moulin. Water eventually reaches the bed of the ice sheet and increases the pressure, lifts up the ice from the bed, and it can allow the ice to flow faster. But that actually doesn't work at all. Uh, and it's still, <laughs> it's still a topic of study. It turns out that this effect is not very long-lasting. And if you pour more water at the base of the ice sheet, it raises the pressure faster, but eventually that pressure is released once all the channels underneath the ice sheet start to connect to each other, and that happens sooner when you put more meltwater. So the meltwater in Greenland is mostly a, a net loss of mass at the surface. It does not influence the dynamics. And we know there's another component of Greenland changes, which is ice dynamics, and it's not due to more lubrication uh, of the glaciers at the bed. It's due to something else. The past 10 years, we've been trying to unravel that. Another very important component, of course, of, uh, of these ice sheets is that they, the ice is being dispersed to the coastline through these glaciers, this network of glaciers. We see that in the Antarctic here with these flow lines. It's not a uniform piece of ice. It's organized in a set of rivers and ice streams. The warm colors faster flow. And you can see in the Antarctic that these glaciers reach out hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers inside the continent to pull ice from the continent onto the coastline. Most of the changes, however, that are happening in the ice sheets uh, are along the periphery, uh, and they're controlled by glaciers. Which means that in practice, even though we're looking at big, vast extenses of ice, what we really care about right now is what's happening right at the edges, uh, at the periphery, in the warmer past, uh, in a warmer part of the climate, uh, Similar to what you would be worried about if you're looking at glaciers in Patagonia and Alaska. Forget what's happening in the interior. It's not very important for the coming century. Everything is controlled by these rivers and how they interact uh, with the climate at the periphery. What we discovered sort of in the last 10 years is that these glaciers interact very strongly with the ocean. This is an animation here in Greenland uh, where we have warm water in the lower part of the ocean. So that's a distinction between the ocean that you can find here off the coast of California and what's happening at the falls. Here we have the warmer water at the top. Uh, in in the polar regions, it's the opposite. We have cold, fresh water at the top and warm, salty water at the bottom. Right? They, they stable down there because they're salty. And it takes instruments. Uh, uh, you have to go down to 400 meters, 7 meters, 100 meters of water before you hit that. Uh, warm water. You don't see it at the surface. So everything happening in the ocean, in the polar regions, is down below. Uh, much more difficult to measure from satellites. Satellites cannot probe what's happening 400 meters below the surface. They only look at the skin depth. So we really have to lower instruments, put robots uh, to measure this temperature. And in Greenland, when we started some of these measurements in the early 2000s, there was almost no data in any fjord. This was the state of knowledge back then. And in Antarctic, in 2019, there's a few places that are well instrumented, but the vast majority around the continent, very close to the glaciers, there's no data. There's no instrument operating in these uh, difficult waters. In terms of melt intensity, you can melt the surface about a meter per year, typically, uh, on the top from climate. 
at the bottom from the ocean, you melt it in one day by one meter, right? It's 300 times faster what's happening at the bottom. And that was the difficulty of understanding that, is because we don't see any of this from the surface. In the Antarctic, the sources of uh, warm water are not from the North Atlantic, they're from the Antarctic circumpolar current. This is water that's about plus two degrees C, that may not sound like uh, very warm uh, for a bathtub, but uh, this is four degrees above the melting point of, uh, of seawater. And you see here the depiction of the typical column of water in the Antarctic. You have the warm water at the bottom that can melt the ice very effectively, and you have the cold water at the top. We know that since about the 1980s, the wind regime that controls the circulation of these waters around the Antarctic has been increasing as a result of uh, global warming and also as a result of the cooling of the stratosphere in Antarctica uh, caused by the ozone hole. And that tends to uh, uh, contract that circulation towards South Pole. It pushes the waters at the surface towards the north and it pushes the bottom waters towards the south, which is the Antarctic. So this increasing wind regime has been pushing more warm water towards the Antarctic continent. And we think that's the major reason why uh, the glaciers are changing in the Antarctic. In fact, there's no surface now in the Antarctic. Now, there's another concept that's important to, to, to know about, which is the concept of marine ice sheet instability uh, that was discovered uh, by uh, uh, modelers back in the 50s and 60s. And uh, at the time, we did not have any data to verify whether these, uh, these projections were true. Now we know that they're true, but uh, there's basically two configurations for an ice sheet. It can rest on a prograde bed, so the slope is rising inland, or a retrograde bed. There's a lot of places like this in an ice sheet because you tend to put a lot of ice in the middle and push the crust down, so it tends to create these retrograde slopes. And uh, these uh, theoreticians showed back then that uh, in the case of a retrograde slope, you had only two stable positions for an ice sheet. Either it would creep to the edge of the continental shelf and break into iceberg, or if it starts retreating, the other next stable state would be a floating ice shelf. So when people realized that, they thought, uh, they looked at the configuration of Western Antarctica, they thought, why is Western Antarctica here? Because it has retrograde slope, and this is not stable. Or well, we just had to wait a little bit of time if you are seeing the, the whole thing uh, retreating. Progress slope is stable. So everywhere on the ice sheet where we have this retrograde slope, we know from theory, from very simple theory that was uh, uh, confirmed by observations over the last several decades, that once you start pushing the ice sheet away, there are some feedback mechanisms that will make this retreat unstoppable. Stable, unstable. Grace can sample all of them worldwide, and you also see that sort of curvature uh, in the trend. These are maps, spatial maps showing in red the places that are losing mass. You see that this is affecting the entire Greenland ice sheet. And in the Antarctic, it's mostly that part which we call West Antarctica, but there's a little bit of signal in the southern part. All of Greenland, a little bit of leakage in the Antarctic, a lot more at stake here. Uh, if we look at this acceleration, and we extended it time just to see where are we right now besides the 30 centimeter per century sea level rise that is measured over the ocean by altimeter. If we extend that to the end of the century, we get 80 centimeter of sea level rise. So my take on this is that the ice sheets are already on a pace to raise sea level one meter per century today. From basic physics, we know that this process is, has no reason to slow down. It should only get a little bit faster with time. The big question is how much faster can it be with time? Can we go all the way to four meters per century? And I don't have the answer for you, right? We don't know that. We spent quite a bit of time uh, in, in the last 20 years uh, doing airborne experiments in Greenland and Antarctica to map the bed of the ice sheets, to know where these retrograde slopes are. And since 2015, we started an extensive program to measure ocean temperature around Greenland. We don't have an equivalent program for the Antarctic as of yet, unfortunately. So where are we uh, in terms of, the, of what I call the big guns in Greenland and Antarctica? So this is a map of the bed of Greenland, and in blue, everything that's blue is grounded below sea level, 
So that's conducive to rapid changes because if the ice retreats, the ocean will follow through and keep melting the ice very fast. So there's three brick drainage in, in, uh, in Greenland, the Peterman Humboldt, uh, the, the 17 and North Zachary Eastrom Gate, and then the Jakob Savan East Gate. In the Antarctic, there's lots of floodgates. Uh, the big one that's acting right now in Western Antarctica is the Amazon Sea sector, which has a 1.2 meter sea level rise equivalent. But we have also signs of changes in these two areas, so two glaciers, this is the sea level equivalent from these two glaciers. Right? One glacier, Totem, 3.9 meter global sea level rise equivalent. More than all of the Western Antarctic ice sheet. We go back to 2004 in the Antarctic Peninsula where this uh, floating extension of the glacier collapsed as a result of uh, warming of uh, uh, air temperature and also warming of the ocean temperature uh, underneath. So as this uh, ice shelf collapsed, uh, we were curious to see what happened to the glaciers upstream, whether they would speed up or not. And indeed, uh, those upstream of, uh, of the ice shelf sped up by a factor of three to eight. And we are now 15 years later, and these glaciers are still flowing at about five times their original speed. Uh, so they're just spilling as much ice as they can into the ocean. And if we were to uh, extend this sort of experiment of breaking up the ice shelves all around, all around the Antarctic, I told you earlier, you can just do a simple math and see that we would raise sea level by four meters per century, which would be not a pleasant thing to adapt to. The biggest sector of change in the Antarctic is the Edmonton Sea sector, and we have an animation here showing the glaciers with a fast flow in red. This is the Pine Island, the Twaits, there's one called Pope, Smith, and Kohler. You'll hear more about these glaciers because I'm sure they're going to dominate the news about the Antarctic for decades to come. Uh, this is a marine-based sector, which uh, has a 1.2 meter sea level rise equivalent, and all these glaciers are retreating together at the same time, spinning up and contributing to sea level rise in a major way from the Antarctic. This is the Smith Glacier, which retreated about 35 kilometers since the 1990s. Peeling off the surface here to show you what the bed looks like, a very deep bed that goes deeper inland. Uh, we have some new results from this glacier uh, that we're publishing. It's retreating at three kilometers per year right now. This is the fastest pace of retreat uh, of any glacier on the face of the Earth. The fastest pace of retreat of glaciers on Earth are in this sector of Antarctica. They're not in the Alps. In the Alps, it moves very, very slowly. Right? Uh, three kilometers is what you get over 50 years. Here, you get three kilometers in one year. And you would not be able to tell that from looking at the glacier from the surface. Uh, you have to peer down, you have to use special techniques to, to, to see these, uh, these changes uh, taking place. Uh, so of course this is very important because uh, to observe that, because the models in these regions typically project a one kilometer <coughs> retreat, and what we're observing right now is a speed up of this retreat by a factor three. Uh, I mentioned the Totem Glacier, uh, which has a 3.9 meter sea level rise equivalent. In 2016, a team from Australia uh, got the first evidence of the presence of warm water in front of the glacier. This was the first time people actually dropped an instrument in front of that glacier in the history of mankind, 2016. Uh, so there's a lot of concern for that, but I have some good news for you, is that this glacier is protected by a prograde slope for 50 kilometers, so it's gonna take a lot of heat and changes before this glacier goes away. So we have time on this one. We don't have much time on the Western Park, but we have time on the, on the total glacier. So uh, we are on a rate of one meter per century today. And we could potentially switch to faster rates. Uh, we know from the paleoclimate record that when the Earth was a little bit warmer than today, or maybe just about the same, sea level was six to nine meters higher. We know that for sure from the paleo record. We don't know how long it took to get to six to nine meters, but we know that the end result is this. For that to happen, you have to melt a lot of the marine ice in Greenland, and that's not enough. You have to melt some big sectors in the Antarctic as well. And Western Antarctica is not enough either. You have to have some big changes in East Antarctica, and right now we don't know where these changes came from. Large uncertainties are how much is the ice going to melt in contact with the ocean? 
a lot of the projection, IPCC type of projections, have a very crude way of including the ocean in their models, uh, uh, but we're working on making this better. And then how fast will ice break through fracture mechanism into the ocean, the calving of iceworks? There's still a lot of uncertainty in that. In some of the most recent models I've seen, depending on the parameter you choose, you can change uh, the mass loss in the next century by a factor 10. So this is, this is really huge and we, uh, we're not, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainties in this. We have to map the bathymetry in ocean temperature and up. damage starts at about one meter sea level rise. Uh, I like to put this plot here of the airports in San Francisco and the Bay Area because they're all within one meter of sea level rise. So by the end of, of the century, we have the potential of not having an airport in San Francisco. Uh, I'm not sure how they plan to deal with that. Um, the irony also of sea level rise is that even though all of the melting occurs in the polar regions, uh, because of the way the earth crust responds to the unloading of ice mass at the pole, it tends to rise sea level faster away from the poles, right where we are. Right? So basically what happens in the polar regions may seem very remote and irrelevant to us, but it's raising sea level about 20 to 30 percent faster here than it does in other parts of the world. And in fact, in Greenland, beach property is going to be expanding because the ground is rising in Greenland as a result of unloading. So sea level is not rising, it's lowering around it. I call this the, uh, the Band-Aid approach, which is adaptation. Uh, one of the big things we have to work on is to communicate uh, uh, risk, the uncertainties of the science. Uh, we're not doing a very good job with that in communicating the uncertainties. The uncertainties are not of the sort uh, of, uh, is sea level going to rise? Yes, it's going to rise. Uh, are the models correct? Yes, the models are correct, but they are very conservative. They don't give you the tail end of the projection. And that's, as a great strategist, what I'm worried about. Just how bad could it be? And evaluate the impact. I think if you want to do CP planning and, and you're know, involved in policy making, you have to look long term about the economic cost of not doing anything today. We have to adapt seaport, airports. I know the military uh, in the U.S. is very concerned about that. Uh, we've been concerned for a long time. They want to know if their facilities are going to be underwater. Move or protect. Uh, there are security and ethics uh, issues. Uh, a lot of infrastructures, as you know, are at sea level. Uh, the populations that are going to be impacted the most are the poorest population. They won't be able to adapt. They will have to move. And this is going to create a risk of massive immigration. We should keep in mind all the trouble we have around the world right now associated with immigration. And the immigration caused by sea level rise in the future could potentially be of a much bigger scale. So even though it may not seem like our problem, uh, the problem will come to us. Mitigation. To avoid the commitment to multi-sea level rise, we must transition to carbon-free energy production for the whole planet as soon as possible. The second point is that uh, even that won't be enough. Sorry to say that, but that's the reality. Uh, even the 1.5 uh, degree above pre-industrial uh, warming that the uh, Paris Accord was based on is just something that politicians came up with, but it's not supported by the science. The world would not be in a safe place with 1.5 degree uh, above pre-industrial. Greenland will continue to melt for centuries in an unstoppable fashion. And I think that for the Antarctic, it's not even safe either. Uh, so that means that uh, we sort of passed uh, uh, that threshold uh, where uh, we launched the polar ice sheets into irre irreversible melt. We need to develop techniques to sequester uh, atmospheric CO2 back into the ground and plant in the seafloor. And that will be also necessary because coming to a totally carbon-free energy production is also something very challenging. So this is important to do. In fact, the big grant that Caltech got just a week ago is dealing with that, uh, developing techniques for secondary carbon. And we sort of know how to do it. The problem is to do it on a massive scale in an economic fashion. Uh, there's no magic fix. And at the end of the day, uh, this is uh, what we'll, we'll get, uh, a world informed by science with clean energy, clean air, clean water, and sustainable and equitable development. I think there was a lot of negativity uh, uh, about climate change and blaming all companies for spilling all the CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. We buy gasoline from them. We need them, right? So 
we're not the ones to blame. Uh, I think we have to look at this in a more positive fashion, that this is sort of forcing us to transition to a different type of society, different types of energy production, different way to care for the planet. And we're not going to suffer from that. It's pretty clear to me that we're going to be much better off uh, once we put our energy and efforts into moving into that direction. Uh, thank you very much.